Hey everybody, welcome to week nine. I'm uh, redoing this lecture. I don't know if anybody got a chance to see the last one for week nine, but I'm redoing the whole cellular regulation one. Um, we're gonna talk about cancer in general, that's exemplar 2A, uh, with a little bit of information on benign neoplasms, malignant cells, and so on. And then we're gonna talk about breast cancer, colorectal cancer, leukemia, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and skin cancer. Um, mostly what you'll need to know is the nursing care of such. Maybe just a little bit of patho, <clears throat> but we're not gonna go really in depth with that. So, and the nursing process, of course. So here we go. There's about 96 slides. So hopefully this won't be too long. All right, so we'll start with a little bit of pathophysiology about cancer in general. So you have the neoplasms, which can begin as benign or malignant, basically just abnormal growth arising from some kind of cellular, cellular mutation. Um, the two types we have are benign neoplasms. They are slow growing, they're encapsulated, um, whereas malignant neoplasms are aggressive, invasive, and capable of metastasis going through the rest of the body to um, infect or cause cancer to other body parts. <clears throat> malignant cells, um, their characteristics are rapid proliferation loss of specialization, invasion of surrounding tissue, altered structure, and their ability to promote their own survival. So when somebody has a malignancy or malignant cancer, that's usually a really bad thing because it means some of the cells travel through the lymph nodes and going into the other body systems. So let's talk about tumor invasion and metastasis. <clears throat> um, tumor invasion generally uh, involves some aggressive disruption of neighboring tissues uh, and metastasis entails uh, the spread of the cancer through the blood and the lymph nodes or the lymph lymphatic systems um, to form secondary tumors and other organs. Usually the immune system responds to neoplasms, but cancer cells uh, may totally evade that system and establish um, metastatic lesions, which contributes to disease progression. Some etiology. Um, one theory is the carcinogenesis, car, carcinogenesis theory, can't even talk. Um, it's a cellular mutation, mutation, oncogenes, uh, promoting cell proliferation, and tumor suppressor genes inhibiting abnormal growth. Um, external and inter internal factors like exposure to carcinogens from either the work environment or some kind of really toxic environment and genetic predisposition. Like if somebody in your family has, or is susceptible to skin cancer or colorectal cancer or breast cancer, um, that could be genetic and you have a higher chance of developing a type of, one of the types of cancers just because of your genes. And some viruses um, may cause uh, this, so they can uh, in induce uh, cell mutations and impair immune function. So it just makes uh, cancer susceptibility higher. <clears throat> so let's talk about risk factors. There's some mixed ones. Occupation uh, can be modifiable or non-modifiable. Um, some occupations post distinct risks, for instance, uh, 
outdoor workers face solar radiation exposure, so skin cancer. <coughs> Healthcare workers encounter radiation and carcinogen, carcinogenistic substances. Um, the federal government tries to mitigate these hazards, but sometimes, um, you know, things happen. Infections, certain viruses are linked to cancer, like HPV, that causes uh, genital warts. Some variations um, of genital warts or HPV uh, can cause cancer down the road, mostly cervical cancer. Uh, safer sex practices, including condom use, uh, reduce the risk of uh, sexually transmitted infections that are associated with cancer, and HPV happens to be one of them. Um, and in general, uh, vaccination against HPV, which usually starts in the teens, I believe, uh, protects against cervical cancer. Non-modifiable risks, and remember, non-modifiable means you cannot change uh, the risk. So smoking would be immodifiable because you can stop. So hereditary, um, 5 to 10% of cancers have a hereditary component. A genetic predisposition, age can't change that. So cancer incidence increases with age with about 80% of diagnosis over 55. Um, age related factors as we age is basically we start dying when we're born. But as we age, there can be some genetic mutations, immune decline when we get older and accumulation of free radicals contributing to cancer susceptibility. Um, sex, gender can influence cancer risk. Uh, breast cancer is predominantly women. And prostate cancer is only in men because men only have a prostate, at least as far as I know. Now, variations in cancer, um, incidences between the sexes, heightens the importance of gender-specific preventative measures. Some modifiable risk factors, poverty, um, and the social, social economical factors um, can sometimes limit healthcare access to some people. So that could be an issue. <clears throat> Stress, Um, sometimes chronic physical and psychological stress can contribute to cancer initiation and, um, <clears throat> and progression through dysregulation of body homeostasis. Some unhealthy, unhealthy coping mechanisms under stress like overeating or substance abuse can further heighten the risk of cancer. A diet, that's a modified viable risk factor because we can change that. Um, certain foods that promote cancer, um, high fat, low fiber diets and consumption of genotoxic substances increase the risk of various cancers. And the three biggest ones probably, uh, tobacco use. So a lot of carcinogens in tobacco use. Um, when people quit smoking, no matter what age, it greatly reduces the risk of cancer, uh, particularly lung cancer and other tobacco related malignancies. <clears throat> alcohol use, <coughs> excuse me, alcohol consumption enhances um, carcinogen exposure, can cause or has a higher risk of uh, oral esophageal and laryngeal cancers. Recreational drug use, um, like marijuana, for long periods of time is associated with testicular and lung cancer. And some other recreational drugs can suppress the immune system and promote cancer development. BCD is one. Um, can change the hormone levels. So it can increase certain hormone 
dependent cancers such as breast and prostate cancer. So breast, women, prostate, men. <clears throat> Sun exposure, um, getting a lot of ultraviolet radiation can uh, really increase the risk of skin cancer, which could metastasize to other body parts. Uh, sunscreen use and sun avoidance um, are crucial for skin care or skin cancer prevention. Some prevention strategies, we just talked about one. Um, and this involves uh, choosing a healthy lifestyle that's including quitting smoking, uh, moderating alcohol intake. You don't have to quit altogether, but if you are drinking a pretty good amount, a couple of few drinks a night, you might want to cut down on that. A balanced diet, regular exercise, and vaccinations. One in particular is the HPV vaccination that we talked about earlier. <clears throat> Occupational safety measures uh, can help minimize exposure to toxins. And public health efforts uh, need to focus on raising awareness and promoting behaviors that mitigate cancer risk. Clinical manifestations. <clears throat> So, includes a disruption of function. So, some tumor growths and also brain cancer or tumors in the brain and other parts of the body um, can lead to obstruction or pressure on organs. And like for colorectal cancer can cause complications like bowel obstruction or bladder Cancer could cause urinary retention. <clears throat> Liver function impairments um, by tumors result in several nutritional hemos, hematologic problems, ascites, where fluid builds up in the abdomen, and esophageal varices, where the uh, <clears throat> arteries and veins kind of come to the surface a little bit more and they're easily irritated and can bleed. Some hematologic alterations include uh, leukemia <clears throat> and gastrointestinal tumors can disrupt normal blood cell function. And this affects immunity and clotting. Renal cell carcinoma um, can cause polycythemia, increase blood viscosity and promoting thrombus formation. Infection, it's kind of a big one. Um, so tumor invasion and tissue necrosis uh, really jacks up the, the cancer risk for patients. Um, all right, let me back up. Yeah, tumor invasion and tissue necrosis predispose patients to infections and septicemia, so blood infection. <clears throat> Malignant involvement of immune uh, organs impairs immune response, um, increases susceptibility to infections. Hemorrhage, so bleeding out, that's a possibility. And probably should know this, um, anorexia cachexia syndrome where this is characterized by um, pretty quick weight loss and muscle wasting and tumor-induced um, metabolic alterations and appetite suppression can exacerbate this. All right, so next one. Perineoplastic syndrome um, so basically it manifests uh, diverse uh, systematic symptoms away from the primary tumor site 
potentially indicating cancer or complications. Pain, there's always, there's usually pain involved, either acute or chronic. And it where, depends on where the tumor is uh, located and what organ might be involved uh, or treatment side effects. This can greatly impact uh, comfort and quality of life. Psychological stress is a big one. Um, they're gonna, most patients are going to have a psychological, psychological response to cancer diagnosis. And this would include fear, grief, guilt, anger, isolation, and uh, maybe know a little bit of oncologic emergencies. <clears throat> Um, and this could be either metabolic, hematologic, structural, and treatment-related emergencies, like tumor lysis syndrome. Hypercalcemia is a big one for a lot of tumors. Uh, neutropenic fever and spinal cord depression or compression. Some of these, and you should know this section, require prompt recognition and intervention uh, to prevent adverse outcomes. Collaboration, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, diagnostic tests and therapies. <clears throat> so there's always imaging, and I think this is on another slide too. Um, X-ray, CT, ultrasound, or MRI uh, can generally locate abnormal tissues. Some microscopic Histology, histologic examination via biopsy or a pap smear, which is a cell shed, is necessary for identifying cell types and structural differences. Screening procedures like PSA for substances or to detect substances secreted by tumors, and PSA is pretty specific to uh, prostate cancer. Increased levels of enzymes or hormones may indicate uh, tissue damage or cancer prevention. So some enzymes or hormones are gonna be measured as well. <clears throat> grading and staging. Um, usually grading involves uh, assessing cell differentiation and growth rates um, with high grades indicating greater malignancies. Staging classifies cancer based on tumor size, lymph node involvement, and distant uh, metastasis. Like if you start with skin cancer and it goes to the lungs. Uh, the TNM staging system, tumor size, lymph node involvement, metastasis is widely used to classify uh, variations from different types of cancer. And I'll keep this up here for a minute. <clears throat> So the tumor has several stages there, and you can see the manifestations. The same thing with nodes, stations, and metastasis. So M0 being no evidence of distant metastasis. And then you have M1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> Some cytologic exams. And this was covered a little bit. Um, using a microscope to identify malignant tissues. So specimens can be collected through a few different options. Exfoliating uh, epithelial surfaces, aspiration of fluid from body cavities or blood, or needle aspiration from a solid tumor. Yeah, these are usually spread on a glass slide, fixed and stained for examination of cell morphology. Uh, tumor markers, often proteins uh, produced by cancer cells will kind of tell us what's going on there. Uh, they aid in cancer detection treatment guidance and monitoring uh, response to therapy uh, tumor markers can be derived from the cells themselves or from the host response or immune response to the tumor. <clears throat> uh, 
oncologic imaging includes uh, some of the same things we talked about, including nuclear imaging, angiography, uh, PET scan, usually crucial to diagnose cancer early. <clears throat> X-rays are often used to screen, but not really detect tumors. CT, MRI, and ultrasound uh, provide uh, detailed images, and they're useful for tumor diagnosis and screening. And nuclear images involving radioactive isotopes can detect tumor presence or metastasis. And geography is invasive, and basically it's used to visualize tumor location and blood supply. Uh, direct visualization procedures like uh, sigmoidoscopy, cystoscopy, cystoscopy, sigmoid for the sigmoid colon, cystoscopy, going into the urethra and to the bladder endoscopy, um, up through the, the mouth, through the esophagus to the stomach, and bronchoscopy into the bronchial, into the lungs, um, allow visual identification and biopsy options. And we can also do, not us, but the doctor could do exploratory surgery with biopsies um, to further examine suspected malignancies. Lab tests, there's quite a few of them. Um, we can test the blood urine or other fluids to rule out non-cancerous conditions. And we can form differential diagnosis. <clears throat> Uh, lab tests can clue us into the disease progression. There's also surgery. Uh, we can surgically remove the cancerous lesions if possible. And it'll help diagnose um, or use for diagnostic conf confirmation from a biopsy to alleviate symptoms such as pain or organ obstruction. some pharmacological therapies, and we're not gonna go into detail about all of them, because there's a lot. So chemotherapy, um, that usually targets and destroys cancer cells, but it has a lot of psycho side effects. Now they primarily target rapidly dividing cells, which include cancer cells. However, they also damage healthy cells and like I said, lead to a lot of side effects, nausea, vomiting, pain, and possibly bleeding. Um, chemotherapy can be given in different routes, oral IV, subcutaneous, intramuscular, so on and so forth. And the goal of chemotherapy is to kill as many cancer cells as possible, which allows the immune system to eliminate the remaining cells. Chemotherapy uh, can be used as a primary treatment before surgery or radiation to uh, shrink the tumors and after surgery or radiation to eliminate remaining cancer cells. These are classified into seven categories and just be aware of them. You don't really need to study this extensively. So alkylating agents, anti-metabolic metabolites, anti-tumor antibiotics, hormone antagonists, hormone agonists that stimulate hormones, biological response modifiers, and targeted therapies, and so on. Now we're on to breast cancer. <clears throat> Primarily, um, almost always found in females, women, and there's maybe a 0.5 or so percent that men could develop certain breast cancer if they have like gynecomastic um, breast or chest. So this usually begins with single transformed cell, often hormone dependent. Um, it can be either non-invasive or invasive. In situ, meaning like a just one tumor, 
that's kind of not moving around at all. Um, categorized by location and type of cancer cells. Is it ductal, lobular, or sarcoma? And if not caught early and it's a malignant type of cancer, it could cause uh, metastasis to the bones, brain, lung, liver, skin, and lymph nodes. Etiology and risk factors. Um, environmental, hormonal, reproductive, and hereditary factors. Um, some genetic mutations can increase risk. African American women often have more aggressive forms, is kind of what, what the literature says. Some non-modifiable non risk factors include age, sex, genetic predisposition, family history, and previous chest irradiation. Mo and you'll probably want to know that one. Modifiable risk factors include uh, lifestyle factors like alcohol consumption, obesity, and certain hormone therapy replacements like uh, estrogen. That could be a risk factor. Prevention, limiting exposure to things like alcohol, maintain a healthy weight, engaging in regular physical activity. Try to avoid smoking and uh, pollution, prolonged hormone therapy, only take it as long as you need it. And I think one of the biggest ones, and it's kind of, there's kind of a push for it, is uh, monthly self-breast exams, mammograms, and look up the recommended um, how long you should go in between mammograms and clinical screenings. Some clinical manifestations include non-tender breast lumps. So when you're feeling around and you feel a lump, um, that's a possibility. Abnormal nipple discharge, nipple retraction, some skin changes in nipple pain. And these are usually detected by self-examination, partner discovery, it could, be, it could happen, and uh, during uh, your annual mammography. So some clinical therapies for complications, lymphedema, um, symptoms and clinical therapies such as exercise compression sleeves, as you get your lymph uh, can be obstructed and causing leakage out of there, and your arms could be uh, a little more puffy, or legs. Um, bandages, pneumatic pumps, and massage therapy. <clears throat> Radiation dermatitis. Um, some things we could do with that is skin care, hydration, and avoid certain irritants. Cachexia, you know, getting really thin and not able to eat. Dietary modifications, nutritional supplement monitoring. Chemo brain, and I believe you might want to know this one too. Now, symptoms and coping strategies like cognitive, exer or cognitive exercise, stress relief, and emotional support. Collaboration, so some treatments and therapies. <clears throat> some palpation of mass or appearance on mammography may indicate breast cancer. Um, it's recommended every one to two years for women 40 to 70. Um, the providers or nurse who's educated on this and has knowledge can teach about breast self-examination and proper reporting of any changes or symptoms to the healthcare providers. Diagnostic tests include the clinical examination and mammography. Diagnostic tests including percutaneous needle biopsy and breast biopsy for suspicious lumps. Um, if I remember correctly, 
some of the lumps if they feel irregular, that's kind of a, a sign of possible breast cancer. Surgeries, including mastectomy, uh, breast conserving surgery, so lumpectomy is a common option. And this is always usually followed by radiation therapy. Axillary node dissection. And this is uh, usually for invasive breast carcinoma to stage the tumor, but non-surgical methods like sentinel node biopsy um, are increasingly used to detect lymph node involvement. <laughs> and breast reconstruction surgery. Logic therapy include hormone therapy, uh, drugs like tamox, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors are used to block estrogen receptors. This usually inhibits tumor growth. Or BRMs, biologic response modifiers, enhances the body's immune response to destroy cancer cells. And we also have chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And I'll let you read that in a pretty half hour. Okay. Some lifespan modif or considerations. I'm just going to leave this up for a minute. We're not going to really test a lot on this. We'll kind of glance through it. Nursing process. Um, you know, we'll start by conducting an observation and patient interview. Note any of these um, or guarding of the affected breast. Inquire about breast changes and nipple discharge. Family history of breast cancer, hormone replacement therapy, personal history of breast cancer, menstrual history, alcohol intake, pregnancies, physical activity, and dietary history. I perform a thorough physical examination. Um, some possible nursing diagnosis would be potential for infection and risk for injury, acute pain, anxiety, difficulty making decisions, planning, maintaining WBC count and body temperature within normal limits, making informed treatment decisions, expressing feelings regarding diagnosis and prognosis, Implementation. These are always going to be tailored to meet individual needs. I provide education on, um, yeah, skip that colostomy care. I don't know where that came from. Refer to support groups or counseling. Evaluation. I don't know why I have colostomy care there again. If that, um, and adjust the care plan as needed based on patient responses and outcomes. All right, colorectal cancer. So adenocarcinomas. Um, mostly all colorectal cancers start with adeno, adenomatous polyp. Adenomatous means precancer polyps, particularly in the rectum and sigmoid colon. Um, cancers can spread locally involving neighboring structures, metastasize to regional lymph nodes, or distant organs through lymphatic or circulatory system. Is the third most common cause of cancer in the U.S. And risk factors are genetic predisposition, like most of them, family history, hereditary syndromes, inflammatory bowel disease, age over 50, and previous radiation exposure and dietary factors. Prevention um, and detection usually starts at age 45, including fecal or cold blood stool tests, stool DNA tests, flexible sigmoidoscopies, colonoscopies every, I believe it's 10 years or five years. Um, and CT colonographies. 
Um, clinical manifestations and therapies. Uh, could, rectal bleeding can be one of them. And changes in bowel habits. And I'll leave this up here for a few seconds. So we're going to zip through this a little bit. Uh, collaborative care. It's a multidisciplinary approach involving surgeon, ostomy care nurses, dietary counselors, radiation therapists, primary care nurses. Um, diagnostic tests, the huge ones are sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy. Uh, tissue biopsy along with that, just to confirm cancer confirmation. And staged using the TNM system like we looked at before. Surgery, so there's a resection of that part of the bowel. Um, and a colostomy. Um, surgical approaches depend on the tumor location and extension. Colostomy, I think we talked about that, so we kind of know what that is. Uh, there's a few pharmacological therapies. You don't need to really go into that too much. And radiation therapy. Now, lifespan considerations. Child and adolescent. Um, juvenile polyps and polypsis uh, syndromes can increase risk of colorectal cancer in, cancer in adulthood. Pregnant women, women uh, they pose a diagnostic challenge. And older adults. Let you look at that for a second. Nursing process. Communication and assessment are big. Uh, establish rapport with the patient by asking open it questions about their feelings, comfort, and personal background. I uh, collect data through observation and intervention, um, focusing, focusing on these topics. And conduct a thorough physical examination, stool test, uh, bowel sounds, tenderness. I'll leave this up here for a few seconds. Um, potential for infection, acute pain, uh, weight loss, anticipatory grieving, uh, compromised sexual activity, and disturbed body image. Uh, planning um, based on the patient's conditioning, uh, preventing infection, managing pain, promoting proper ostomy care, and of course, family support. Um, so we can provide education and support, direct care before and after procedures. I teach the patient how to use the colostomy care techniques, um, including emptying and changing the pouch. I discuss dietary considerations, especially avoiding foods that cause odor and gas. We refer, refer the patient and family to social services and counseling. Ensure privacy and sensitivity. And then evaluation like everything else. Uh, if the plan doesn't work, modify it. Screen. Leukemia. Exemplar 2E. So let's talk about the patho and etiology a little bit. So this is kind of important to know. It's I don't know if it's going to be on a test or not, but Basically, leukemia arises from uncontrolled proliferation of immature white blood cells, replacing normal marrow cells and interfering with normal blood production. Causes are generally genetic, exposure to certain agents like radiation and chemotherapy, viral infections, and genetic mutations. Uh, leukemia can be classified as acute or chronic, uh, and the cell types lymphatic, lymphocytistic or myeloid, so know the differences. Acute leukemias progress rapidly with immature blast cells, while chronic leukemias have a gradual onset with mature appearing cells. Major types, and be familiar with these. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, most commonly in children, um, and like all of these, characterized by abnormal lymphocytic proliferation, manifests by fever, bleeding, lymphadenopathy, 
and bone pain. Uh, we have chronic lymph lymphocytistic lymphocytic leukemia affects older adults. So know the differences. And acute and chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, acute myeloid leukemia common in older adults. And chronic myeloid leukemia associated with the Philadelphia chromosome. Risk factors, uh, genetic, usually, um, such as chromosomal defects like Down syndrome or exposure to specific viruses. And then like with all of them, we have environmental factors, exposure to radiation and chemicals, and smoking is linked to an increased risk of leukemia. And note that high dose radiation is proven modifiable risk factor for chronic myeloidistic leukemia. The main surgical procedure is bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant. Um, let's see, pharmacologic, induction phase for chemotherapy and biologic therapy. So I'll let you look at these. Nursing considerations, we want to monitor the CBC and liver and renal tests or any signs of complications. Managing infusion reactions to the certain medications, infection risk, or other side effects. And of course, with everything else, we want to provide education on symptoms to report and adherence to treatment reg regimen. regimen. Uh, um, Radiation therapy, so high doses of radiation to damage cellular DNA. And next slide. Um, clinical manifestations result from anemia, infection, and bleeding. Um, fatigue, pallor, tachycardia, all of these other ones. I'll let you look at that. Diagnostic tests, CBC with differential, to evaluate cell counts and morphology. Uh, platelet counts to identify thrombocytopenia, so two minutes. Bone marrow examination, or no, that's too little. Yes, too little platelets, which, which could cause bleeding. A bone marrow examination for further assessment. Leukemia in children, incidence and characteristics, um, ALL being the most common type, usually peaks between two and five years with a higher rates among Hispanic and white children and with higher incidence in boys. I'll let you look at that last line. Symptoms and diagnosis, no real screening procedures for childhood leukemia. And usually symptoms include uh, weakness, fatigue, bleeding, and infections can prompt medical attention to look at this. And diagnosis and prognosis are dependent on age, initial white blood cell count, and disease response to treatment. Um, treatments, chemotherapy, uh, usually for childhood leukemia, three phases of treatment over two to three years. And acute myeloid leukemia requires usually two phases with higher doses of chemo. Other therapies like stem cell transplant could help. Prognosis, survival rates of children with leukemia are relatively high, 91% for ALL and 66% for AML. I'll let you look at this research thing, and then I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, so lifespan considerations. Um, leukemia in pregnant women, usually AML, is diagnosed in pregnant women. Acute myeloid leukemia, complex treatment challenges due to 
teratogenic effects of chemotherapy on the fetus, especially during the first trimester. I'll let you look at that. For adults, remember the chronic CLL and AML, or CLL, uh, both of these can cause or be cause or be diagnosed in older adults. Median onset for CLL is about 70 years. Um, acute myeloid leukemia is the second most common leukemia in adults. Median onset about 67. New therapies like venta venta ven venetalex in combination with lower dose chemotherapy could be help, helpful. Nursing process, uh, observation and patient interviews, uh, fatigue and bruising are going to be big. And remember, weakness, infection and bleeding, physical examinations, we're going to examine all these. And identify potential nursing diagnosis, basically the same for all of them. Planning. We want to set goals to prevent infection, um, absence of infection symptoms, expression of emotions, implementation, um, psychological or psychosocial emotional support. We can refer to the family, re refer the family and patient to uh, support groups, tailored treatment based on leukemia type, educate families on safe drug administration prevention and management of adverse medication effects, or prevent and manage adverse medication effects, monitor weight and fusion site, I know, and renal function, administer medications as prescribed to prevent infection. Yeah, basically uh, trying to prevent them from getting infections. I'll let you read that. Protect from injury related to bleeding. Monitor for signs of bleeding. Instruct patients on activities to avoid. Assess vital signs and body systems. Uh, avoid non-invasive procedures if possible. Evaluation. Remember, it always comes to whether the interventions are working. If they're not, tailor them to the patient specifics. Lung cancer. Lung cancer is next. Um, the pathophysiology, um, we have primary lung lesions, are predominantly uh, bronchogenic carcinomas differentiated into small cell cancer and non-small cell cancer. I think we'll probably know a little more about non-small cell cancer. Uh, small cell cancer uh, grows rapidly, spreads early, and produces perineoplastic hormones. Non-small cell cancer, or lung cancer, um, encompasses adenocarcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, and large cell carcinomas. Etiology, smoking, that's about 90% of the uh, cases. Genetic changes could play a role. Exposure to ionized radiation and asbestos is big. Risk factors, smoking. Um, smoking cessation to produce or prevent that. Um, former smokers have an elevated risk, but it can decrease over time. And prevention involves avoiding those exposures to like radiation and asbestos. Clinical manifestations, uh, symptoms depend on tumor location and spread, including chronic cough, hemoptysis, wheezing, dyspnea, chest pain, uh, weight loss, fatigue, weakness, bone pain, localized effects, respiratory symptom, and lung cancer presents a significant health challenge. Diagnosis and treatment. So the first step is establishing an accurate diagnosis. Treatment decisions are based on tumor location, types of cancer cells, staging, and patient tolerance. 
staging. Know a little bit about staging, one, two, three, A, three B, three C, four A, and four B. So stage one, uh, primary treatment with conjunctive or conjuvant chemotherapy and radiation to prevent recurrence. Uh, two, surgery, surgery to remove the affected lobe or lung. Stage 3A, combination therapy with radiation, chemo, and or surgery. And immunotherapy can be considered. Stage 3B and C, treatment challenges due to extensive lymph, lymph node involvement and tumor spread. And the last stage, 4A and B, palliative treatment focuses on symptom relief. And the survival rate of this is low, so know that. Nursing care. Let me center this. Okay. Uh, patient education, uh, symptom management, and teaching involves uh, focusing on the disease process, treatment, and diagnosis. You know, symptom management address treatment related symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and patient teaching. Uh, mouth care activity management, fatigue, and nutrition for both patients and caregivers. Diagnostic tests include x-ray, chest x-ray, which shows the initial evidence of lung cancer, butum specimen, cytologic examination to confirm diagnosis, bronchoscopy, uh, visualizes and the Obtained body special or biopsy specimen, CT scan, kind of evaluates the tumor a little bit better than X-ray, metastasis and treatment response, and CBC function studies and electrolytes. And I think we covered all those. And then types of surgeries kind of depends on where the tumor's at. Pharmacological chemotherapy. Bronchodilators and analgesics to help with obstruction and pain. And the goal is to either cure the cancer or palliation, helping with symptoms. Uh, used alone or with surgery, chemotherapy can debulk tumors, relieve symptoms, and treat complications like superior vena cava syndrome. And I think there might be a question on that. So, no that under lung cancer. Lung cancer in children is very rare, but the tumors are generally malignant. Uh, treatment involves surgery to remove the tumor and additional treatment based on the type. Lung cancer in women, uncommon during pregnancy, could happen later in stage. And I'll let that go. Lung cancer in older adults, um, most common cause of death in this population, uh, per primarily non-small cell lung cancer. Older adults represent a significant portion of lung cancer diagnosis. Um, a CGA helps treatment options. Treatment strategies vary on stage and subtype. Timeliness of care affects prognosis. Assessment, identify risk factors like smoking or asbestos use or breathing in, exposure. Um, let's see, observation, potential diagnosis, inadequate gas exchange, ineffective breathing patterns. So think respiratory status. Planning, uh, maintain oxygen saturation respiratory rate and cardiac function, and of course, pain relief. Patient, patient education and emotional support are important. Um, we want to promote effective cardiorespiratory function, manage fatigue, and assist with activity tolerance. Education on nutrition, infection prevention. Um, evaluation. Like always, if something doesn't work, change it. And it's always going to be individualized. Prostate cancer. Now, this happens in males. Um, 
originates from glandular epithelial cells in the peripheral zones of the prostate gland. Androgens are believed to play a role in its development. Tumor may compress urethra, which generally leads to uh, urinary flow obstruction and can metastasize to near structures. Exact cause is unknown, but it could be genetic mutations, age, race, diet, obesity, environmental factors. Some of these inherited gen genetic mutations. And we only have about five minutes, so I'm going to try to wrap this up in skin cancer. Um, age is the greatest risk with African-American men and those with patient family histories have a higher risk. Uh, dietary factors, obesity in certain occupations like firefighters can be at higher risk. Medications, I'll let you look at these two, but they have some side effects. Screening should begin at age 50 or above. Clinical manifestations, early stage prostate cancer may be asymptomatic. Pain from the bone metastasis is a common initial symptom. Usually it's too late. Uh, urinary manifestations, I think we know those. You can see that. Clinical um, enlarged prostate may cause urinary symptoms and erectile dysfunction. We already said, talked about the bone. Weight loss and fatigue occur due to increased metabolic demands. And I think we'll skip that nursing process. Discomfort urinary manifestations, hematuria. Physical examinations, a digital rectal examination to assess the prostate size, symmetry, firmness, and nodules. And then I think we know the pro diagnosis, nursing diagnosis, plan, addressing the patient concerns. Sensitive sensitivity provide or sensitively provide holistic care to address all these needs. Promote urinary elimination. Facilitate uh, communication about sexual function changes. And evaluation, same thing as I said before. Okay, skin cancer, I think, is our last one. Uh, skin it's, can be susceptible to damage from ultraviolet radiation and chemicals, leading to skin cancers. Melanoma, arising from melocytes, is the deadliest skin type or skin cancer type, so probably known that. Non-melanoma skin cancer involves basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. Precursor lesions of melanoma include congenital nevi and some of these other things. Pathifications and of malignant melanomas exist based on growth phases and types. Basal cell carcinoma arises from basal cell or basal layer of the epidermis, while squamous cell carcinoma originates from the squamous cells. And I'll let you look at that last one. And got a couple more minutes. Etiology, UV radiation. I think we know sunlight and tanning beds can cause skin cancer. Genetic predisposition, fair skin, high number of moles, moles, past history of skin cancer and family history. I'll let you look at the environmental factors, host factors, and actinic keratosis prevalence is higher in people with light colored skin. Prevention, avoid Prolonged sun exposure and tanning beds, apply sunscreen, protective clothing, regular skin exams, avoid exposing newborns to direct sunlight. Clinical manifestations, we'll go over these real quick. Uh, range in color from brown to black, that's melanomas. Often slightly raised or, or irregular surface, that's how you can kind of tell. Uh, vary from size and irregular pigmentation, typical will appear on the face, trunk, arms, but can occur in other places. Surgical incision is common, uh, while chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and radiation therapy. Regular examinations are crucial. Non-melanomas, 
um, smooth papule with steady growth. Shiny skin over the tumor may ulcerate and bleed easily, common in the trunk and extremities. Superficial basal cell carcinomas, flat papule or plaque, um, may ulcerate or crust, common on the head, face, and neck, so kind of know some of these. Pigmented basal cell carcinomas, uh, dark brown, blue, or black, with shiny surfaces defining borders found on sun-exposed areas. In morpheoform basal cell carcinomas resemble flat ivory scar with finger-like projections, usually in the head or neck. Keratinistic or keratinic basal cell carcinoma begins as small, firm red nodules that ulcerate and become painful, common with UV exposed areas. Squamous cell, car cell cancer starts as small, firm red nodules, may ulcerate and bleed and become very painful. Treatments include surgical excision, keratage, and electro dissection and then these other things. cryotherapy, freezing it off. And actinic keratosis, urethematous, roughly rough macules with shiny scaly appearance. And urethematous means red skin. <clears throat> Found on the face, hands, forearm, upper trunk. <clears throat> Transformation of malignancy suggests by enlargement or ulcerate, ulceration. Man, I've been talking a lot. Treatment includes cryotherapy, freezing, topical creams and gels, shave, excision, curatage, and electro desection, blah, blah, blah. Collaborative care. Requires an interdisciplinary approach involving many healthcare professionals. Uh, nurses play a crucial role. Treatment options non melanoma skin cancer, surgery, curatage, cryotherapy, radiation, with a cure rate of about 90%. Malignant melanomas treatment involves surgical incision, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and radiation therapy. Diagnostic tests um, using the ABCDE rule, asymmetry, border, irregularity, color variation, diameter greater than six millimeters, and evolving. Microstaging involves assessing the level of invasion and maximum tumor thickness. And then look up the Clark and Breslow Breslo systems are used for this purpose, for microstaging. Surgery, we talked about that. Uh, pharmacologic therapies, immunotherapies. I'll let you look at these other ones. Radiation therapy. Lifespan in children, it's rare, but it could happen about 2%. Research indicates that exposure on tanning beds increased the risk for melanoma in children. Skin cancer in adults, um, incidence of skin cancer increases among older adults. Uh, it's found that one in every five Americans will develop skin cancer by age of 70. Uh, symptoms, presentation of skin cancer in older adults may differ from younger individuals. Um, older adults are at risk, greater risk due to factors of immuno sense, sense, cumulative exposure to carcinogens and UV radiation. Treatment for older adults with skin cancer is similar to younger adults. But comorbidities may limit surgical options. Uh, complete lymph node dissection uh, it may be necessary for malignant mel melanomas, but the procedure's morbidity is significant in older adults. Prevention. Um, 
skin cancer prevention efforts in older adults have been limited, but could greatly benefit from education on risk reduction. Um, and we're just going to breeze through this. Um, look at moles. We did a skin assessment during first term. So I'll let this, I'll leave this up here. Perform thorough physical examination of the skin. Noting moles, uh, enlarged lymph nodes, discolorations, areas of ulceration, scaling, crusting. And record and describe all skin lesions. A diagnosis, impaired skin integrity, lack of knowledge about skin cancer, planning, individualized, implementation, um, provide education on sun and tanning bed exposure, decreasing that, uh, regular skin self-examinations, addresses feelings of hopelessness, reduce anxiety, and encourage active coping skills. Evaluation. This is the last slide. Yay! Assess patients to in meeting their goals. Um, talk to them about self examinations using the EBCBE guidelines and removal of suspicious, les suspicious lesions. And that is it. It's a little over an hour. However, we do have time in there where some of our lectures were a little bit short so this one's a long one and y'all have a great day great weekend and i'll see you friday